And welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. The shoulder has more movements and more motion than any joint group in the body. And if it's got more motion, it's got more bones, it's got more muscles, it's got more tendons, it's got more bursa, it's got more opportunities for injuries. And we're gonna be talking about common shoulder injuries on this show. What causes them? What can we do about them? How dangerous are they? And how easily are they fixed? My guest is Dr. Paul Brady. Dr. Brady is a board certified orthopedic surgeon and he deals with shoulder problems every single day. I could always remember him teaching me about the rotator cuff in the shoulder one time about which muscle groups are probably causing problems. I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on The Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be trying to figure out how we can work the shoulder in with exercise, nutrition, sleep, and most of all, having fun throwing ball. We're talking with Dr. Paul Brady, board certified orthopedic surgeon, and we're talking about the shoulder and the many problems that it can have. Paul, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being uh, here. It's my pleasure. Tell me, why is the shoulder so important? Well, the shoulder, you know, we use it for our daily life, and it's really what differentiates us from, from all the other animals out there, that we have functionality in our upper bodies to do pretty much anything. So the shoulder is pretty critical to our existence. Is it easy to injure the shoulder then if it's so critical and moves around and throwing and catching and, and pulling and doing everything that we do? hurt easy? That's the problem with it. You know, it's a plus minus. I'm glad we have the shoulder, but because it has so much motion and so much functionality, it's prone to injuries. It's got more motion than any other joint in the body by far, and therefore it's very complicated. And because of that, you can have injuries that occur in the shoulder that are very debilitating for patients. So, are there lots of muscles and lots of tendons? There sure are. In total, there's about 17 muscles wow. that work together. And I, I tell patients, I think of it like an orchestra. And if, you, the or, if every instrument is working perfectly and on tune, it sounds beautiful, it works perfectly. But you get one or two out of tune, those are the only things you hear. So it doesn't take much in the shoulder to really make it painful. When I think of shoulder injuries, I think of different age groups, and athletes have trouble with their shoulders, baseball, football, uh, people have dislocation, people fall and hurt their shoulder on the playground, even at an earlier age, and then as we get older, the muscles sort of dry up on us and, and tear <laughs> right. easier. Right. So, what the, uh, tell me about a rotator cuff, what, what does that mean? So the rotator cuff, is a group of four muscles in the shoulder. They're the largest and the strongest muscles in the shoulder. Then now they're deep. You can't see them. When I look at you, I can't see your rotator cuff, but it's down deep in the shoulder and they attach to the top of the arm bone, the four of them. And the four of those together in concert are responsible for pretty much most all the motion in our shoulder. So if you get a problem with the rotator cuff with one or two of those muscles or tendons, it can be a real problem and can cause a lot of pain and dysfunction. So pain is one of the things that a person has. That's right. I, I saw a tailor one time who fell hurt and just completely couldn't lift his arm up. What would that make you think of in the rotator cuff? Absolutely, that that's, can be a devastating injury because if you can't reach overhead, you, there's a you're lot of things you can't trouble. do in life, you yeah. know? And so, so that makes me think that that person had a significant injury to their rotator cuff. They probably tore two, maybe even three out of the four tendons if they can't lift their arm. So how do you tell? I mean, you know where it is, you know where the problem is, 
How do you define which of those muscles are the real culprits? Great question, and, that, and that's a key, right? To know exactly what we're dealing with. Have the right diagnosis before we start treating things. So some of the things we use for diagnosis are things like x-rays. We start with x-rays. What kind of x-rays? X-rays show bones. So we take x-rays of different views of the shoulder. X-rays do a great, great job at showing bones and showing the alignment of the shoulder. Next, we move on to things like an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging machine. And a lot of people don't like that machine because it's, it's, it's a little confining, but it is so good at being able to really delineate what the problem is in the shoulder. So and we use that a lot. those machines better and better. They really are. They have open MRIs. Yeah. They're larger. The one that the UT football players, I mean, that, that, that's a huge machine. You know, you can barely know you're in a tube. Uh, so. so when you're looking at an MRI, versus just a regular shoulder x-ray. Is it like night and day? It, it, you see different things. So they're both important and they're both critical to my diagnosis, but the x-ray shows bones and the MRI shows all the soft tissues, the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, and all those things in the shoulder. So using the combination of those two together is how we make the correct diagnosis. Now, it's my understanding as people get older and the muscle sort of dries up a little bit, you have frequent little tears maybe. Are they usually in the tendons? Are they usually in the muscles or where are they? They're typically in the tendons and my thought process is like a, uh, a rubber band. If you have a rubber band, as long as you stretch that rubber band every day, probably gonna stay pretty healthy for a long time. But if you put a rubber band in a drawer and you don't touch it for a while and you pull it out, it's gonna break in half. So that, that really, I tell patients all the time, it is so important that we stay active and we stay moving and we stay healthy in order to keep things as healthy as possible. Now, you mentioned when you have a shoulder injury, you have pain. Is the pain worse any certain time of day, any certain motion? And I'm thinking specifically yeah. about nighttime. Nighttime pain, that is the most common symptom I hear from patients. Nighttime pain and arm pain, those are the two things. A lot of people don't think it's their shoulder, they think it's their arm. It's their shoulder that's radiating down to their arm. The reason it hurts at night are twofold. Number one, your body has nothing else to think about at night except for where the problems are, okay? So during the day, you're too busy, you're active, but at night, your body can really concentrate on the problem. So that's one reason. But the main reason is because at night, we lay flat, which takes gravity out of the situation. And gravity pulling the arm down actually makes the arm feel better. Ah, so when we don't have gravity, everything mm. kind of hikes up and the pain becomes much worse at night. If I'm standing up, then the rubber band is sort of stretched, stretched and, uh, and does a better job. That's exactly right. So when somebody has a tear, uh, are they usually little thready tears or are they wacko? You got a big one. So the tears come in all different forms and shapes and sizes. And frequently we have, we differentiate between what's called an acute tear an injury, you get pulled by the dog or you fall down the stairs. That's typically a very sharp tear versus a chronic tear. So little injuries over time, football, baseball, all the injuries that you had when you were in high school, plus the ones you had when you were in middle age, and then those add up to what's called a chronic tear, which can be more uh, difficult sometimes to treat. When you treat a tear, uh, do you have a certain pathway? Well, let's take some analgesics and ice and rest. What, what do you tell the patient? And then what kind of physical therapy? And then when, how do you know when surgery is needed? Exactly. So frequently I'll tell patients we have five options. You can live with it. You can treat it with medicines, which may work for a little while, but it's not going to fix anything. You can treat it with shots, steroid shots. And for certain tears, it works great. It really calms down the inflammation, allows them to rehab better and get better without having surgery. The next is therapy. You can do therapy on the shoulder. Now therapy won't fix a tear if it's a full tear, but therapy can help all the muscles around the tear yeah. and help you live with a small tear. And then the final option is surgery. Some patients have tears which really aren't gonna do well with those other four, and they need to have surgery to have it fixed. Is it a 
need for surgery that eventually, hey, we've tried everything, we're gonna to have to do surgery. Is surgery uh, effective and are, is there, can it be done arthroscopically? Great, it, it, absolutely it can be done arthroscopically. And that's what we're gonna be talking about when we come back. It can absolutely be done arthroscopically. Well, that's great. Uh, let's see how and what we do and what the results are. We're talking with Dr. Paul Brady, board certified orthopedic surgeon, and we're talking about the shoulder and how easy it is to hurt the shoulder. And we started talking about the rotator cuff, some muscles that make the shoulder wiggle and do what we want it to do. Uh, different muscles, different tendons, different tears. Uh, we talked about physical therapy. We talked about trying to get the shoulder better. And then we decided sometime we might need surgery. And we talked about arthroscopic surgery. Correct. You can do that on the shoulder. Absolutely. There's, there's really almost nothing except for arthritis. It's tough to fix arthritis arthroscopically, but pretty much everything else we can address arthroscopically, which means minimally invasive, small incisions, no big incisions. It's an easier surgery from a pain standpoint. It's an it's a, it's a easier surgery from a recovery standpoint as well. So I take it before you start on the arthroscopic surgery that you've made the diagnosis of the x-rays, you know which muscle group or which tendon group is causing the trouble that you're gonna to have to repair. So walk me through somebody with a rotator cuff and arthroscopic surgery. So we start the surgery by just looking inside the shoulder with the camera and taking a tour of the entire shoulder, okay? Right, so I wanna see everything because you can't get better diagnosis than actually mm. having eyes on it, yeah. right? MRI is great and x-rays are great, but nothing is better than having your eyes on the problem. So we'll diagnose first and then methodically we'll go through the shoulder and fix things as we come to them. And the way we repair the rotator cuff is we use these things called anchors. They're small screws that go into the bone. They're actually bioabsorbable, so your body just absorbs them over a couple years. And we use those to uh, use sutures to repair the tendon back to the bone. And then your body heals that back where it belongs. So you have a fixer screw right. that lets you then grab hold of the tendons or the muscles. That's and, exactly okay. what we do. Exactly. Sounds simple. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's not. It's a little complicated, uh, but it works. It advances, and um, you've been involved with advances in the technique and the material use. Tell me about that. Well, I've been very fortunate to be involved with a, a orthopedic sports medicine company and I've, I've got six patents on products that we use in the shoulder and actually several of my products are used in the knee as well. But they're products that we've used and we've, we've developed in order to better fix the tendon to the bone so that our repair is stronger. And so we're getting better and better at that every year. It's really exciting. So if you repair a rotator cuff, how long does it take to get better and what kind of therapy is needed before the person is able to go out, throw a ball or cause trouble again? Well, I have to say, <clears throat> this is the downside, right? The surgery is getting better and faster and less invasive and less painful, but the rehab still takes a long time. And, and I tell patients it's three phases of recovery. Phase one, just relax let things heal for the first month, okay? Don't overdo it. Phase two is start working on your motion with therapy. And it takes several weeks of physical therapy for patients to get their motion back. So it's Sometimes important to have a good weeks. physical therapy department. Oh, therapy is critical to really do your therapy and to work with the therapist. And then the last phase, the third phase, is more therapy for strengthening. That's usually when people really turn the corner and feel like they're getting a great shoulder again is when they build strength in the shoulder. It must be great when the person goes through those phases and they're doing well and they say, hey, I'm gonna shake hands with you and show you how strong my shoulder is. It, it's, it's wonderful, I love my job. Now I'll tell you, at three months, most patients <laughs> give me that crooked eye. Are you <laughs> sure that we did the right thing? But by four to five months, they usually bring me cookies and they're very happy with their shoulders. Isn't, so. and isn't that a great feeling? It's a great feeling, yeah, yeah. Let's switch a little bit. Let's talk about a frozen shoulder and then we'll talk about 
separation dislocation. Great. A frozen shoulder is a condition where the inside of the shoulder joint called the capsule gets tight and it gets irritated and it gets painful. And I'll be honest, we don't know exactly why sometimes. Now we know it's way more common in women than men. Uh, diabetics get a much worse case of it, but it's a very painful condition where you not only have pain, but you lose a lot of motion in the shoulder. The good news on frozen shoulder, 95% of the time we ah. can treat it without surgery. So how do you treat it? cortisone shots uh -huh. to calm down the inflammation, uh -huh. and then pretty aggressive physical therapy. They've got to really push you in order to get your motion back. But if the combination of those two is 95% successful at avoiding surgery. Can you prevent a frozen shoulder? Let's say you have rotator cuff surgery, and you just don't use it. You just don't use physical therapy. You just don't move it. Does it freeze? Well, that's a, it will freeze every time if you do that. And, and that's a, a, a discussion that I have with <laughs> every patient because it's so important that we do the rehab. And if you just have a spontaneous frozen shoulder, it's important to see a doctor soon. Don't let it get to where it's tight as a drum, you know, get to the doctor when it's just starting to uh, get tight and painful. And if you get to the doctor earlier, you're, you'll get, you'll recover much, much faster. If it's spontaneous, if you get it, all of a sudden, uh, it's painful. It's one of the most painful conditions. Okay, so say, I gotta go to the doctor to get it fixed. Absolutely. Let's, let's talk about dislocation and separation of the, is there a difference? So there is a difference. Dislocation means the ball comes all the way out of the socket. Ah. If you truly dislocate, you're probably not getting it in by yourself. You're probably gonna have to have a trip to the emergency room. Those type of injuries happen with accidents like falls or, or in younger patients, collision sports, football, or they're sliding into home plate and they dislocate their shoulder. Uh, whereas a separation means that it, it moves, but it doesn't go all the way out of socket. So a separation is not quite as severe as a dislocation. Once you have a dislocation, is it easier to get a second dislocation and have your shoulder pop out? It sure say? is. In fact, in fact, young patients, our current recommendation is as soon as you dislocate one time, you ought to get it fixed because there's a 90 plus percent chance that you'll re-dislocate and do more damage. Now, once you get to the age 40, 50, the re-dislocation rate is much less. So those patients, we try to treat with rehab and, and exercises and therapy to get them a better shoulder. So surgery early, what do you do to keep it from popping out the second time? So the reason it pops out is because the ligaments are loose. I think of it like a hammock, and if one side of the hammock is broken, it's really hard Boom. to hang in the hammock, right? I mean, you can, you can hang there, but as soon as you fall asleep, you fall out of the hammock. So what we need to do is we go, need to go and tighten those ligaments so that the ball sits right in the middle of the socket the way it ought to. You do um, that arthroscopically also? That's correct, yeah, so arthroscopically. Everything's pretty much done arthroscopically. It really is, now. except for treating arthritis, we can treat almost everything else arthroscopically. Do you have to use any of those new fixits to fix it, to uh, get the shoulder where it doesn't stay so loose? We do, we use anchors and we use sutures in order to repair everything, but the technology of those uh, anchors and sutures has really come a long way, and so that's exciting. Pretty good results from a dislocation repair. 95% of patients will never dislocate again once we get them fixed. Must so be fun being those a, are good sh a shoulder results. surgeon. And it is a lot of fun, thank yeah. you. And uh, it's great listening to you talk about those. Uh, can you get arthritis of the shoulder and is the clavicle, the collarbone, is that considered part of the uh, shoulder? It is. So the two things that hold the arm on uh -huh, are your clavicle. That's what we're going to be talking about when we come back. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Brady just likes to teach and teach and teach. <laughs> and we'll come back to the collarbone and maybe some arthritis, some other problems. Um, but I'm only going to give him a little bit of time. We're talking with Dr. Paul Brady, board certified orthopedic surgeon, and we've been talking about rotator cuff injuries and other problems in the shoulder that can almost all be fixed now arthroscopically. 
where you've got better vision and better control of what you're doing. And as Dr. Brady said, there's nothing like being able to look in the shoulder. X-rays are good, but being in there looking at the real tissue is a key to improvement. And it's amazing to me how many people do so well after shoulder surgery. Now, we talked about the clavicle. That's the collarbone. That's right. the little bone up here. Is it easily broken, and is it hard to repair, or do you just let Mother Nature do it? Well, it's, it's, it takes some force to break a clavicle, and it's frequently younger patients who still think they're invincible <laughs> and <laughs> playing sports and mountain biking, and they have an injury where they have a significant force that breaks the clavicle. Now, whether it needs surgery or not really depends on how far the parts are displaced or shortened. There's a few things we look at on x-rays. Fixing it is pretty straightforward. We put a plate and some screws into the bone to hold the bone in position, and it usually heals very well when we do need to fix it. For a 25-year-old, young, healthy, active, uh, they break their collarbone. How long does it take the bone to heal? So total healing probably takes four to six months, but you can't stop them by month number two or three. I mean, they are ready to go because it <laughs> feels so good. So I tell patients, even though you feel great at month two or three, don't go crazy until month four to six because that's when it's really healed. And so four to six months. Uh, arthritis of the shoulder, we were talking earlier, that sometimes is difficult. Arthritis is a tough problem, you know. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't have the all the answers for arthritis, but we certainly are doing a lot better than we've ever done before on treating arthritis. So, do you clean up the joints? Do you, if they're all spiky and gravelly, you, you clean it out, and then you use medications and physical therapy. What Sometimes do do? a clean out does work. You know, an arthroscopic surgery, if mm -hmm. they have mild arthritis, and we can just clean, smooth the rough surfaces, sometimes that's a very effective surgery. But more often than not, they may end up needing a shoulder replacement. That means taking the arthritis out and replacing it with a metal ball and a plastic socket. Can you do that arthroscopically? No, I wish we could. That, <laughs> that, that'll be in the future maybe. But right now we still have to do an incision to, to do it that way. Recovery time for a replacement? Well, most patients feel better very quickly within a week or two from the pain, but the recovery still takes a long time to allow everything to heal, then to work on motion, then to work on strength. So I would say right in the three to four month range for them to be feeling good and six months before they're feeling really good. You know, the, the thing that impresses me, Paul, is that the shoulder has so many possibilities of hurting itself that you need a shoulder specialist most of the time to fix a shoulder and fix it well and takes experience and it takes the drive and, and you certainly uh, love what you're doing. I do love it. And that just makes, that warms my heart yeah, to well, see a you. physician who really likes what Absolutely. they're doing, really has a good time. I want to thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. You're a great, great teacher. Thank you for having and me. And we have learned a whole lot on this show. Thank you. You'll have to come back again. Thanks. I will. Let's look at the shoulder and see what the shoulder can do as far as those four things we like. Number one is exercise. Well, the shoulder is responsible for every time you lift and you pull and you wiggle. So you got to have a good shoulder. When it hurts you, it hurts your ability to exercise. But also, we can work on our shoulder frequently to strengthen it so it won't get injured. And when we exercise, we feel better. It makes us relax, it will lower the blood pressure, it makes our whole body better. So taking care of your shoulder is part of taking care of your body. Be sure that we eat, eat properly. You know, if we eat poorly, then the shoulder is not gonna have a chance to have its tendons and muscles to get strong and to grow well. So think about your shoulder when you're eating and be sure you're eating enough protein in your diet and that you're eating less calories and better food. Uh, in America, we have a problem sometimes with obesity. We eat too much and we don't exercise enough. 
So be sure you exercise. Use your shoulder when you exercise uh, and have fun with your next door neighbors. Pitch a ball as you're walking, but get your tennis shoes out and get walking. We need to do that at least 30 minutes and we need to do that four, five, six times a week. No reason we can't do it five or six days a week. Seven and a half hours sleep. You know, the shoulder will keep you f uh, from sleeping well because it hurts at nighttime. So if you've got a bad shoulder, you're gonna have to get it fixed. Uh, it's one of the common causes for people not being able to sleep well. If we get seven and a half hours sleep, if we get rest for our body, our brain will function better. We'll be happier, we'll be less irritable. The people around us will be happier. Uh, the fog over our head won't, won't be there. So be sure that you're getting seven and a half hours sleep. And most of all, what do we like in the Dr. Bob show? It's that laughter in your life. You know, can you make somebody happy? Can you fix happiness? Yes, you can. You know, you can talk to people, you can joke, you can tell funny stories, you can look at pictures, you can read books, you can watch television. There's lots of things that you can stimulate your mind to be happy. But the best thing is to get together with your family, with your loved ones, tell stories and tell how you messed up on certain things and just laugh and laugh and laugh. And if you stay happy, you'll stay healthier.